Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Morgan, and I will be one of your presenters today. I am here based at the headquarters of Yellowscan in France. Uh, I'm here with Julien, our technical support manager. Hello. And we are in direct with quantum system uh, Martin Herkommer from uh, Germany. So, uh, first of all, a little heads up with the housekeeping. I will. So as you may know, you're muted for now, but please feel free to write all the questions you want. You have a sidebar on the, on the, on the webinar. Of course, uh, you are able to write any questions. We will answer them at the end of the webinar. Your bottom taskbar may have some part of your uh, screen, so please do not hesitate to ask, do you use mod, auto hide mode? Um, we will have at, at, at some point of the of the webinar you will have a questions so we will give you 20 to 30 seconds to answer it it's really quick it's so you would have time don't worry and of course the last but not least you can watch it again after this webinar so thank you for joining us today so a little bit a little heads up on the agenda today of course you will have the presentation of the use case and at the end you get the result of it um, you get a little bit of more um, information about the VTOL drone and, of course, some LiDAR insight. But now to begin, I will let the mic to our dear friend from Germany, Martin Herkommer. Thank you, Martin. Great job, isn't it? It's a large area with limited access it's about the measurement of dumps, stockpiles, and excavation volume. What are your options? Measuring with mobile mapping and classical surveying is expensive, time-consuming, and not always satisfactory. The measurement with classic airborne LiDAR is not cheaper and also difficult to plan with regard to the availability of the aircraft. Multicopters are only suitable for relatively small areas up to 160 acres. In addition, it is very risky to operate a LiDAR sensor using a multicopter. The solution is the combination of VTOL fixed wing UAV and LiDAR. This is very fast, reliable, and the result is a survey grade 3D point cloud, which is available immediately after landing. Why using a VTOL fixed wing to carry the LiDAR sensor? A VTOL fixed wing UAV combines the following features, very high endurance, very easy handling, high flight speed, and vertical takeoff and landing. Now it gets exciting. Let's talk about LiDAR. Julian, please explain some technical details to your audience. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Um, we say we made the survey with LiDAR, but what is a LiDAR? Uh, will you explain briefly for the people who don't know yet what it is? So a LiDAR is a bit like a radar or a sonar, but instead of a radio wave or a sonic wave, we send a, la a light wave or so-called a laser. So the laser runs from uh, the, the sensor and it gets reflected on an object here at the top of a tree and it's sent back to the sensor and we receive uh, what we call an echo. Fortunately, the laser, we can go through the vegetation and so a part of it will also reach further another part of uh, the tree or go up to the ground, and down to the ground. So 
sorry, and be sent back to the sensors and we will get another echo. Uh, from that we will, we will uh, measure the traveling time and from the traveling time we can get the distance with the distance and the orientation, then we can get the position. If you do it once, then you will have one point. And if you do it again and again for thousands of time and even millions of time, then at the end, you get a real nice survey. That's a castle in the south of France. Okay. If you like the video, show it again. <laughs> Right. But there is LIDAR and LIDAR and we need, I would like to explain you now how to do, to measure the quality of the LIDAR system. So there is basically three main components about that in front of the position of, uh, of the LIDAR. There is a scanner, there is the initial motion unit or IMU and there is a GPS. Each of them are they have their own error, and this is where the engineering and the design allow the, the solution to be more or less precise. So if we look at the scanner precision, the scanner will measure a distance. So there will be some error on the on the distance measured. That so the the earth entity and the position will look like this. Then if you look at the IMU quality, the IMU or inertial motion unit records angles and so the angle precision will be like this and so the uncertainty will look now like a small box. But if we look now at the GPS pre precision, the because Maybe the, the drone is not exactly here, but it could be just a bit shifted. Then it's like if we shift the whole, the whole thing. And if we look at the uncertainty box, sorry for my French accent, it's difficult to say uncertainty. Uh, then it will look like this, a bigger box. So here are the elements that we use in the LiDAR that was used in the use case in South Africa. It was in the ULTRA, we have the VLP32 for the scanner with a precision of three, four centimeters. For the IMU, we have the Aplanix APX15, which is a good quality IMU. And for the GPS position, uh, we post-process the trajectory with the post-pack software, with the PPK and infusion, and we can reach the same accuracy than RTK, around two to three centimeters. Um, a bit more about the scanner now. Um, the scanner, the VLP32, has 32 beams. That's why it is called the VLP32. And, but there is the irregular beam spacing, which means the, the beams are closer to each other, close to the nadir. And thanks to that, we can see more details or acquire more details um, where it matters the most and where there is a less error. Um, the, the scanner has, can record up to two echo, so there is a strongest and the last return. And it is pretty nice for the for the drone and the and the fixed wing. Um, yeah. Now the lidar position quality. If we look at all these elements together, uh, what is the accuracy that we can expect from the Surveyor Ultra? Um, we can reach from all these various elements and thanks to the design, we can reach an accuracy of eight centimeters in elevation in Z and 10 centimeters for the X and Y. 
So now I'm going to show you how it looks like now that you know what is a good quality LiDAR. So let's see now for our products. Okay. Okay. Here is the Surveyor Ultra. We are here. We can recognize the scanner. Here on top, we have the flap where you can have the battery or the memory stick with the data. Uh, here we have some connectors, but the system run independently. So these connectors are just for external power source if needed, but there is internal battery. Uh, for an option of the live station, which can have a live streaming, and to record event if you do a flight with a RGB camera at the same time. Here we have the yellow button, and it's actually the only button you need to use on the field to start and stop the recording, and also to turn off. The main aspects of the Surveyor Ultra, the, um, the main benefit is, first of all, it's very light. It's only 1.7 kilogram, and that includes the battery and uh, accessories such as GPS antenna. It is very compact, very small, easy to fix on a drone. And we have built-in boresight angle, which means there is no calibration to do on the field. It's uh, really plug and play, and you even don't need to plug. Um, the Surveyor Ultra can fly up to 160 meters above the ground. So the higher you, you fly, then the safer you are, and also the wider the swaths of uh, acquired field for, for each flight line. It can record up to 600,000 points per second. So with this high density that allows you to see more details, or, or, but also to, to have high speed flight, and still very easy to use. That's our motto, so just one push button. Okay, and now that I've shown you the, the LiDAR, uh, we'll let Martin to, to show why it fits perfectly with the VTOR. Yeah, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, the, Tron, the Tron is the perfect platform for the Severe Ultra, just introduced by Julian, because the Tron has a maximum takeoff weight of 31 pounds, and it flies with the perfect speed for the Yellow Scan Ultra at 38 knots. We only need about 10 minutes from the box to the air, and the 90 minute flight time is a great endurance to cover more than 1,729 acres or 2.7 square miles. The drone can carry 4.4 pound payload and therefore the Ultra fits perfect to our UAV, which can handle up to 23 knots of wind speed. The high quality payload compartments make the drone a perfect platform for the most device sensors. The standard payload compartments range from RGB cameras to multispectral sensors to technically perfect integration of the yellow scan Surveyor Ultra. The sophisticated integration prevents vibrations and there are no cable connections to the UAV. All you need is a yellow button to start and stop the recording before and after the flight. Now let's have a look at the video, showing a bit more about this technology. Here we can see the nose cone with the integrated yellow scan ultra. It's connected to the aircraft with four secure screws. And then the takeoff, just by one single button press, the aircraft is doing autonomously a transition, and then it's on automatic flight mode for around about 90 minutes. So we can cover around about 700 hectares of forest, urban areas, rural areas, and the live view station can show you the data in lifetime. 
So you see what you get while the aircraft is capturing the data in the air. Once the mission is finished, the aircraft will return home automatically. It will perform a transition back to the helicopter mode and it will perform an automatic landing. So there's no much space needed to operate this aircraft. It can lift off and land from any place greater than five meters. And it's a very easy operation. So let's summarize uh, the Tron Ultra bundle facts. The speed of the Tron at 38 knots is perfect for the fast yellow scan severe ultra and the long endurance allows large survey flights with only one battery for 90 minutes. The point density is with up to 70 points per square meter, good enough for most of the applications. And the Cubase flight planning software helps the customer to plan complex area and corridor mapping projects. It's an easy to operate system with the focus on safety and reliability. So now I would like to hand over to Morgan. Morgan, are you there? Yes, uh, so guys, as I told you before, there's the poll now. You will have to answer one uh, small question and then I give you 30 seconds to do it. So which part of this webinar are you the most interested in? You have the choice between the VTO, the LiDAR, and the use case results. We would like to know what you think about the use case results are coming next. In the meantime now, we're going to talk about uh, the result. The idea is to show you the project characteristic, then um, the resort on the, the battery use and all these details. And then Julien will uh, show you uh, some uh, cloud station and, and result live. So now I give the hand to Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, welcome back to South Africa and our coal mine surveying project, northeast of Johannesburg. We had to survey a 1.5 square mile area with only one flight at around about 90 meters above ground. The mission was therefore planned at 60 meters above the takeoff location. And now let's have a closer look at the flight planning with Cubase. This is the Cubase interface, and once we loaded the, the area, Cubase is automatically calculating the runs, and we can set up the gap distance between the runs, we can set up the altitude, and we could adjust the direction. With a one button press, the software is calculating all the turns, all the flight, the flight times, and we can easily add a takeoff and landing location. This is the takeoff location, with the transition cone and with the another click, we can add a um, landing location with the retransition. And once this is done, uh, we can have a look at the mission information. This is a flight with 53 minutes, pretty close to what we did. This is a bit depending on the wind speed. Today, we have an automatic wind detection for South Africa uh, for our east, northeastern direction with 1.5 meters per second only. In the project, we've been flying with more than eight meters wind per second. And uh, with another uh, single bottom press, we are transferring the flight plan to the aircraft. And then we can take off automatically. We fly the mission and we land it. Um, here's the Tron ready for takeoff. And after the 56 minute autonomous flight, the Tron was landing safely exactly at the takeoff location. So this screen shows the ground station display just before landing. As you can see uh, here in the top, the wind, the wind speed is uh, eight around about eight meters per second or 60 knots and the elapsed mission time is uh, 56 minutes and still there is a remaining battery power 
of 43 percent. So let's check the final results. Um, the flight time, as I said, around about 56 minutes, the battery use 57 percent and 240 million points have been captured on this mission. Julian, would you like now to show the final results? I'm pleased to hand over to France. Yes, for sure, Martin. So, for the final results, I was... Ah, sorry. For the final results, here it is. So we have here the point cloud that has been colorized because there was a flight. But if we look at all the point cloud that we taken by LIDAR, it was the square that we can see it is larger. So here I want to insist on the fact that this is not a raster because from far we can be confused. So no, this is really each point cloud, each point of the point cloud has a color. And okay. So if you look at all the characteristics, I can show the and the classification on the points. So here, okay, it's a it's a mine, open uh, open mine. So it's mainly ground, but we can still see a few buildings that are in green and a few vehicles that are in red. Okay, if we look at the building colorized and, uh, and classification, you can see it's really matched together. So the camera and the point cloud really to match. Um, on, the, on the right of the prospect, we can see a high voltage power line. And I will zoom a bit on it for we can see the power tower, electric tower. Yeah, thin slice. And if we zoom, yeah, zoom, 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 zoom. Yeah, to see the kind of details you can see with the, the one flight of the surveyor, uh, the ultra. So we can see really the structure of the of the tower. Uh, you've seen the power lines before. Okay, that's. Let's come back to the global view. And uh, now I can show uh, to colorize the point cloud by elevation. Yeah. So it takes a while. Now we can turn. We put the EDL filter to, to see a bit more the to emphasize the relief. And Okay, now we zoom and focus on the stockpile and the, and the pits. So you see, if you have some uh, volume calculation, it's very easy with the point cloud. You just delimit the area you need and you can make all your stockpile uh, calculation and evolution. Okay. Um, just some zoom on sm some small details. We have here a dozer and that we can see very well with the RGB camera, but we can see it also very well on the point clouds. Uh, here we have some warehouses and we can see the shape of the roof. So now it's time for Q&A. So please don't hesitate to write some questions and we'll answer them. Morgan? Yes, uh, so here is going to be my first question. Uh, so this might come for uh, Martin. There appear to be seam gaps in between flight lines where data sense density is lower. Is this outcome available during flight acquisition in real time in order to adjust Titan line spacing during missions, or would it be only noticeable once it's post-production? Okay. So it appears to seem gaps in between flights. Okay. You said for Martin, but actually it's for me. Well, I think it's for you, in fact. <laughs> so it's for me. you know what? Let's share it. 
Okay, let's see the presentation. Ah, sorry, sorry. Okay, while you do this, what software do you use for Pond Cloud scholarization? Uh, I used Terra Solid, and where you can um, you have some module to to create auto photos or to and to re to colorize uh, the point cloud. So if I go, sorry, tick tick tick. Um, and, So yeah, so for the first question, I will answer in a few minutes. I need to look so, some data and to show that there is no gap between the flight lines. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask a question for Martin. What is the pond cloud accuracy that you can reach with your system? Do you need ground control points to reach it? All right, you're muted. No, you, you go for it. Oh, Martin, you're muted if you try to speak. Life is tough. <laughs> so now I can speak. And now I'm not muted anymore. Thank you very much, Morgan. I uh, got the question. So the overall point cloud accuracy is um, the result, as Julian tried to explain, of uh, more than one component. Um, it's definitely not um, correlated with the flight on its own. Well, a little bit by the flight altitude, but mainly it's a result of the IMU, the GPS, and the laser accuracy. <clears throat> and what we see is an overall absolute accuracy, which is just better than 10 centimeters, so something around 5 and 10 centimeters, but the relative accuracy is much higher. So I would say the relative accuracy of the point cloud is more closer to 4 centimeter or 5 centimeter than it is to 10 centimeter. For sure, the density is something we can influence by our aircraft. We can fly lower uh, to get a higher density and higher to get um, a lower density. And if uh, you would please share my screen, uh, Morgan, I can show you what the what the what the altitude what role the altitude plays um, on data capturing with the Yellow Scan Ultra. Yeah, the you have now the the screen. I have on a screen, yeah. So while we've been talking, I opened Cloud Compare and I'd like to show you three missions from this year. Uh, we captured data from three different altitudes. As you can see here, there is one flight at 160 meter above ground. So this is a couple of runs in 160 meters above ground. And as you can see, there are no uh, dropouts uh, in the area. The end is the agricultural fields, which are without vegetation for this moment. It's just in, in spring before, um, before we can see the, the, the wheat coming out of the ground. We can see single trees standing here on the field and we can see the forest and we can see a lot of ground points in the forest, even from 160 meters. However, um, when we fly lower, I will now uh, activate the 120 meters, we get more details. I deactivated 160, so now you can see we get more details on the single trees, on the standalone trees, and we get much more details on uh, forest areas because there are just more points hitting the ground and there are more points um, hitting first and last pulses on different places in the forest. So in the in the lower vegetation, in the middle vegetation, and the high vegetation. While in the 160 meter flight, we pretty much only hit the high vegetation. And now I will I will show you another data set from 60 meters above ground, and uh, you will see some cables, some kind of power lines, but these are telephone wires which are only three meters above ground. This is a very small telephone wire at the, with wooden poles, and we can see that we got clearly got all the all the free wires from 60 meter above ground. That means we are still more than 55 meters above the small and thin wires, and we got a very highly accurate and dense point cloud on the forest, 
and on the on the single on the single solitaire trees. So again, if we watch this this tree here at 60 meters, I just let it activate, and I maybe I give him a little a little eye dome lightning so we can see it a little bit clearer. Now I activate the I deactivate the 120 meters. This is 60 meters. This is 120 meters. And now I will activate a one, the 160 meters. This is 160, and this tree seems to disappear because there are not enough points hitting the tree at 20 meters per second. But if we zoom out, we can see that we still got a nice terrain model from 160 meters above ground. I hope this answers the questions. And uh, as you can see here in this data set, there's definitely no gaps in between the runs. Um, gaps are mainly caused by too, uh, too great distance between the flight lines. Um, the rule is um, the distance between the flight lines we use is 1.5 factor of the altitude. So if you fly at a 100 meter altitude, the spacing is 150 meter. If we fly at 60 meters, the spacing is 90 meters. That's the rough rule, which I came along with and it's working since now it's working for every single project and Cubase is very handy to assist and there are new features in Cubase for corridor mapping where you can fly along um, road structures, power lines and so on and Cubase is taking over all your basic calculations for the overlapping and for the point density and uh, so it's, it's, um, it's an easy to use system uh, bundled together with the Tron and now I give it back to the microphone, I give it back to Morgan. Morgan, are you there? Yeah, I'm there, but uh, I think uh, Julien wanted to add something to your uh, to your answer, so I will let him to go. No, it's just in the question, there were also, uh, do you need GCPs? And no, that's one of the main advantage for, of LiDAR compared to photogrammetry. It's you don't need ground control points to, to reach this accuracy. Um, I would like to come back to the previous question. I can have the screen. The one about the gaps between the, the flight lines. So this is the data set that we were showing before. Let's show you not lying. If I show here the points per flight line, there are one color per flight line. And uh, no, there is no gap. Maybe it was because of the refreshing time of cloud compared to, uh, to, to display all the points. I remind you there is more than 240 million points. But no, there, there is absolutely no gap here. Okay, we can go to the next question. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna do three more questions and we will go on. So next question is, uh, uh, for you, Martin, can you tell us how the drone take off and land uh, that you just showed us? And then what is the capacity of wind that it can support? And as well, can live station be included in this solution? Martin, are you there? You might be muted. Yeah, so now I'm online. Yeah, I got your question. So the takeoff and landing of the Tron, as you may have seen in the video, the Tron has four engines, four motors, and they can uh, they can be aligned. They can be uh, aligned to the front, so you, as a standard aircraft, or they can be um, they can be inclined to the top, so that there are rotors like a helicopter. So in the rotor configuration. The uh, aircraft is lifting up onto a certain level, like uh, 30 meters, which is a safe altitude. And then the John is performing an automatic transition, moving forward and switching to aircraft mode. So this is something which is automatically done by the system and not controlled by the pilot. So it's completely autonomous. So in fact, what you do is you have a remote control, you press one button, which is called take off. Then the unit is taking off and automatically doing a transition for the, for the forward flight. It's doing the mission. The pilot could interact at any time and get it back to the landing place or to fly manual maneuvers to avoid air traffic. 
We can for sure also show other air traffic with a transponder signal on our ground station. So we can avoid air traffic if necessary and then resume the mission or the aircraft just follows its mission, comes back to the landing place, it's slowing down, it's doing a transition to helicopter mode and descending slowly until it is around about five meter above ground. And then the pilot is using the left stick very slowly to the to the to the bottom side and it's it's descending and uh, once it's touching the ground the motors are automatically switched off um, that's quite easy so morgan what was the, what was the second question the second question is that can we use the live station uh, for the with this combination yes we have uh, we have the opportunity to use the live station it's just a matter of uh, data transfer. What we now uh, would use is the 2.4 um, gigahertz modem to transfer live data. And with this modem, we can roughly get a distance of around about 10 kilometers to transfer the, the live uh, laser data to have a live feedback on the ground. However, it is not necessary to do because um, that's my experience in the field. If you do a nice planning, a good flight planning, you can definitely be sure that the data is fine afterwards. And if you check after landing, what I did in South Africa, so after landing, I plugged off the USB stick from the scanner, I plugged it to my laptop, and immediately I could see what the result is. So there's no big need uh, having a live view for the point cloud. Um, it's just this attracting the pilot. In my opinion, the pilot should watch the, the moving map and the other aircrafts uh, moving uh, by watching the transponder signals or watching and watching the sky to monitor the aircraft to make sure that there is no collision with obstacles, with other aircrafts, uh, with helicopters and so on. So I better like to spend more time watching my aircraft than watching a live data stream of laser data because I'm sure the data is fine afterwards. And if not, I have to repeat the flight anyway. Morgan, are you there? Yeah, hi, I'm there. So we got a lot of questions on GCPs, and I guess uh, Julien can, uh, can have a uh, share insight with you on this matter. Yeah, so there is one question, sorry, I can't see who, who wrote it, um, asking if we use GCP, even if we don't need it, but if we use GCP, can we increase the, the accuracy greater than five centimeters? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you just need some uh, detail that you can see on the, on the point cloud and GCP, and after you can do some matching and move the, the point cloud uh, globally or to do some rubber sheet fitting and and reach uh, accuracy to three centimeters. Um, another question, uh, say no GCP, but did you use a GPS base station and PPK processing? On uh, this uh, point cloud, of course, we post process a trajectory. It is not a PPK. So yes, we had a GPS base station, but in post-pack, it, it uses the infusion algorithm. So it does the PPK processing. So let's say a comparison of a GPS position, but it's actually using the inertial uh, data logged internally at 200 Hertz as the, the base for the computation. And it go to feed the, the inertial algorithm, the inertial computation with the GPS position. So at the end, we are much more precise than just a PPK. And especially that will compensate and avoid all the heading drift that we often notice on the long flight lines. Up to a certain extent, of course. OK, thank you. Do you want to add something, Julien, maybe? Uh, no, can go to the next question. Okay, so the next question is, what is the FOV assuming swath spacing 1.5 attitude? The field of view. Um, the field of view is actually wider than 1.5 times the altitude. 
it, it, what you can record is uh, three times the altitude. So if you fly uh, 100 meters high, you can have a swath of 300 meters. Um, anyway, we recommend to have a coverage uh, overlap, sorry, of uh, of uh, 50%. Once again, this is not mandatory because the, the LiDAR don't need to have some overlap to fit the lines together. It is absolutely referenced directly, but uh, it's just to give more chance, more opportunity to laser beams to go to see things from different aspects. And especially when you have vegetation, it will let the laser beam go through the, the, the leaves and the canopy uh, from different path, and then you have more chance to to reach the ground. So now a question for you, Martin. The pond cloud of the mine in South Africa had real colors. Did you perform a separate flight taking pictures, or the video can together, or the or the video can take them together in the in the same time? Yeah, got, okay, got that question. Um, uh, the answer is quite easy. We are, we, what we did, in fact, is we used the Tron with the LiDAR scanner, and at the same time, parallel to this mission, we've been using our smaller aircraft, the Trinity, which is a below five kilogram aircraft, uh, much cheaper than the Tron, uh, with a Sony uh, camera, with a 21 megapixel camera, and um, this flight was performed with, uh, with PPK. So we've been using um, post-processed um, imagery and the order image we created has the same or even better XY accuracy than, than the, the point cloud. So it was then quite easy to overlay the aerial image, the order photo to the point cloud and to write the color numbers of the order image to the point cloud points. So the RGB colorizing was done afterwards with an auto image captured by our Trinity. Um, the reason why we do not put a camera to the Tron is quite easy. Um, LiDAR and cameras are not fitting together that good, especially not at this altitude, because the Tron is flying at a high speed and the LiDAR is looking at a very flat angle to the side. So the area, the field of view of the camera is much smaller. And we would need more than three cameras to capture the same area like the laser is seeing. And um, the cameras we can, we can buy right now, we can purchase right now, they are limited with the intervals. So the best we can get is around about two images per second. And this is still not good enough to get enough overlap to calculate a good order image uh, from the same flight path we are using with the laser scanner. So that's why we use two different flights and there are two options for the, for the client. One is using the Tron two times, one time with the LiDAR payload compartment and one time with a camera payload compartment. And there we are very flexible with the cameras. We can use cameras with 40 megapixels or cheaper cameras with 20 megapixels. Or the customer uses the Trinity and the Tron. And um, this is maybe a more flexible uh, investment because then the Trinity can also be used for other smaller projects uh, where it's just about um, uh, auto imaging and, uh, and rusted DEMs where we don't need the LiDAR. So my, my recommendation is investing in a Tron with a LiDAR and secondly in a Trinity with a with our RGB camera to get colorized point clouds. More Thank you, Martin. Uh, we have so many interesting questions. So we will go on with two or three more and then we will wrap up this, uh, this um, webinar. One, the next one is for uh, Julien. Is the file recorded at ultra open LiDAR format? software for processing the LiDAR data from Ultra or the Tron Ultra and software uh, to be purchased in bundle? Tell okay, um, I will answer to the first part of this question. Uh, so the first of all, the LiDAR, we can generate it in the LAS format or in a TXT. Uh, that's 
after if you need another format then you will need to convert it um, software for processing the LiDAR data okay uh, what we get from uh, from the ultra we we have three different files uh, I can even the best is to show you these three files uh, anyway so we have this cloud station and uh, when we open yeah actually there is a filter uh, yeah we have a filter we have the apx file and uh, that is where the gps position we have the t04 file which is the raw data of the imu and we have the puck file which is a scanner file and in the cloud station we will do the merging of the two um solution though the the position and the scanner uh it's loading up okay we will we can here put the ppk solution uh to refine the trajectory so that's how it was done and this is where we select the flight lines um, after you just need to to press play here and you will uh, extract create generate the the last files um ta -ta -ta -ta. Okay. are the tron ultra and software to be purchased in bundle concerning at least the post processing uh the lidar the surveyor ultra comes with the post pack software it's a uh, part of the price so the trajectory post processing is included uh, for Cubase and so on. I will let Martin answer. Hello, Martin. So, Munich. Yes, Munich Morgan. is here. Morgan, which question is still open? Uh, the question is Are the Tron, Ultra, and software to be purchased in Bendel? So, we talked about the Ultra and the software processing. And can you talk about the Cubes? Is it included in the price? Is it? Yes, yes. We didn't yet talk about price. Uh, so we sell all our aircraft in complete uh, bundle packages. So everything is out of the box. It's a turnkey solution. So what a customer gets is the transportation case with the aircraft, with the flight planning software, with the ground control software, with flight batteries, remote control, and every option the customer needs, inclusive batteries, to operate the system. Which is not what is not included, that's the payload. So, for example, the Tron is 45,000 euro. And then we have different payloads. And the LiDAR payload, for example, is 130,000 euros. And uh, so from there, it's up to the customer to decide whether to buy one payload or two payloads or more batteries. And of course, we also offer some spare parts like separate wings, um, elevators, um, rear fuselage, front fuselage, nose cones, etc. So yes, to answer the question again, everything the customer needs and everything we have been showing is included. And we would be happy to show all this in detail on the Intergeo if um, some of the, the guys watching today would like to visit us at our booth. Perfect. Uh, th thank you, Martin. Perfect. So I just want to answer two questions. I know that some people have missed the beginning of the webinar. Yes, the webinar was recorded, so you will have it uh, just following, just when it's finished. And you can receive as well uh, sending an email uh, to the uh, to me or to uh, contact and you will receive the presentation so now the last question is going to be for julien then we wrap up this webinar uh, we have a question on can we use a lidar over the water uh, um, okay to go through water you depend on the bandwidth that you use uh, the bandwidth or the frequency of the laser that is used uh, we use a near infrared, so unfortunately it will be absorbed by the water. Um, you get very, very few reflection over water, so maybe close to the nadir, and uh, otherwise now it's all reflected and uh, it's really not ideal. But on the drone world, the um, 
the scanner, the LiDAR that can uh, do bathymetry, so green, I think there's very few and they're all very heavy. So, but basically, no, <laughs> it's really not designed for that. Okay, thank you, Julien. So we received more questions. We will, of course, answer them um, after the webinar directly to your emails. So thank you for your... Uh, Thank you for this uh, interaction with us. So now I will show you a little bit of more application on what quantum and uh, wet yellow scan can do together. So this combination can as well be really good for forestry projects as well as corridor mapping. So if you want to have more information regarding this, do not hesitate. And this is a variety of application thinkable. So you will have the opportunity to read any, everything. So when you will uh, receive the presentation. Three key points to remember to this presentation. First of all, thank you for coming. And we want to emphasize that it's easy to use, it's efficient and of course reliable. So please do not hesitate to ask any questions and we'll be happy to answer you guys. And so for, to answer your questions, you will be able to meet us at Intgeo. So Quantum System will both be in all 12. So you can see here the booth. Uh, we, we have also a Quantum demo every first Tuesday of the month. So do not hesitate to go on their website, www.quantumsystem.com. And of course, in March, we're pleased to organize our, our third user conference ladder for drone in March in the south of France and you get a discount code and we'll be happy to meet you there and uh, to share with you use cases, demos and uh, of course a networking session where you can enjoy French wine and some cookies and uh, maybe a cake if we <laughs> cupcakes if we're if there's more American than European. <laughs> well thank you guys and um, and we'll be happy to see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Martin. Bye-bye, Munich. Bye, Munich. I'll yeah, bye-bye from Germany, too. Uh, have a good day in France and all over the world, and especially a good day for our friends in the US. Yes. Goodbye. Bye.